a Baroque masterpiece with effeminate curves folding inward, then abruptly bending outward. The Palazzo Carignano stands in Turin, in a district fashionable since the late 1670s. When the palace was first erected, the city was still young, with uniform streets laid out only 100 years prior by Ascanio Vitozzi. The Palazzo Carignano drew nobility to the heart of Turin, a palace to where the creme de la creme flocked, a who's who of aristocratic fame. The city was brimming with a princely air, proliferated by the royal family of the age. The Savoys and Carignanos claimed Turin as the capital of their fiefdom, an independent kingdom free from France and neighboring Italian city-states, though nestled between their borders. Turin stretched from Nice to the island of Sardinia and from Sardinia to the northwestern corner of the Italian peninsula, a kingdom of genteel, upwardly mobile elite. And for this stately family, par for the course architecture wouldn't do. For the House of Savoy, something altogether different was required. A palace with regal dimensions and sublime opulence for the Savoy's heir apparent, Prince Emmanuel Filberto di Carignano. When Prince Emmanuel's cousin, the Duke Carlo Emmanuel II, died in 1675, he left the House of Savoy in a precarious place, one breath from tumbling like a proverbial house of cards. Upon his death, the power shifted from the late Duke's nine-year-old son to whomever his surviving widow was favoring that day. The Dowager Duchess, Maria Giovanna Battista di Savoy and the Moor, was better known by her traditional title, Madama Reale, because let's be real, her given name's a mouthful. Madama Reale eventually named her eldest nephew, Prince Emmanuel, as the next monarch when he was 50 years old. The future of the Piedmontese dynasty was held in the prince's hands. The Carignano line didn't look favorably upon the heir Emmanuel, disdained perhaps most pointedly by his own mother. He was born deaf and therefore dumb in her eyes. Despite his impairments, he learned to read lips and even utter a few words to his pompous and arrogant family. He wasn't the clearest or most obvious choice in the Savoy line of succession. But with the Madama Reale seeking power for herself and with her own son Vittorio, too young, the overbearing, power-hungry widow set her gaze on her nephew. Prince Emmanuel would run the state until her own son could come of age. Nicknamed El Muto, the mute, was quiet and cultured. He married the beautiful Maria Caterina de Este, and together they embellished and extended the boundaries of Turin. Now uncontested, Il Muto needed a home worthy of his dynastic fortunes. As one author put it, a palace of regal rather than merely noble proportions for the Carignano line. The prince's former abode, Palazzo Vecchio, which translates to Old Palace, simply wouldn't work. So what is a mute, middle-aged prince to do, with nothing more than a title and a castle? No money, little land, no sound and little voice. The son with nothing in particular. Well, there was really only one thing he could do. And God, it must have taken some courage. Ask his aunt, the Dowager Duchess, Madama Reale, for both land and money. Oh, to be a fly on those gilded walls. Madama Reale, though fickle by nature, saw in the middle-aged prince the potential for something altogether unfamiliar. Stability and power for the Savoy dynasty, with herself at the helm. Sharing the vision with his aunt, and his union with Caterina quickly approaching, Prince Emmanuel showed the Madama Reale how fortunately the stars of fate had aligned. Il Muto received a princely sum, acquiring the Envogue block between Via Principe Amadeo and Via Academia del Scienze, 
With the future of the kingdom secured, championed by the matriarch herself, the Palazzo Carignano would be built, ensuring the growth of the city beyond the medieval walls. El Muto took parcels of land given to him by his father, enriched them with a grant of money from the Duchess, and set out to mark the grand dimensions for the new seat of royal power in Turin. Records from the State Archive describe the fantastic undertaking to construct this monumental home. Construction began May 11, 1679, and the architect of the time was hired three months later. Guarino Guarini would become creator of one of the most mystifying residences in history. The famed and lauded architect was commissioned to design the future palace. Born in 1624, Guarino Guarini, the Sicilian architect from Modena Messina, priest in the Theatine order, philosopher and mathematician, had long worked in Turin. He was the favorite architect of Prince Emmanuel's cousin, the Duke Carlo. Guarini, who had a constant longing for his maternal home, often begged the Duke to return to Sicily. But complex and massive projects throughout the city would demand his presence, and therefore, decades of his life. Upon the news of his mother's mortal illness, a brief return home was all the Duke Carlo allowed. Guarini took full advantage of this respite from Turin by venturing to the center of European art and architecture, the continental capital, the city of love, Paris. Guarini stayed in Paris, working for the Theatine monks designing a magnificent church. He produced an undulating facade for St. Anne la Royale, which some years later would be shown to mirror what he would create for Prince Emmanuel. This genius of Italian Baroque just so happened to be in Paris when another, even more famous Italian architect would find himself in the city of love. Gian Lorenzo Bernini, sculptor and architect, presented his project at the behest of King Louis XIV by unfurling it dramatically across the eastern facade of the Louvre Palace. Bernini's plans, with the walls turning concave on either side of the central rotunda, could very well be the inspiration for Guarini's design of the Palazzo Carignano. There are no official records proving these Italian architectural giants spoke to one another while in Paris. It's not difficult, though, to imagine the Kingdom of Savoy's genius meeting the papal surrogate of Rome through these unexpected delegates. From the similarities in Guarini's design, it's easy to surmise he must have seen Bernini's work. The city was not only home to Guarini and Bernini, but also to Christopher Wren, a gifted British architect who would go on to design St. Paul's Cathedral, a masterpiece in the heart of London. And it wasn't only foreign architects that roamed the streets of Paris designing, creating, and commiserating. France had her own genius traversing the streets. Francois Mansart, who gives his name to the mansard roofs that have come to define the streets of the cosmopolitan capital. Guarini stayed another year in Paris, working to finish St. Anne's before profits ran dry, and he was forced to return to Turin. His church would never be completed, leaving the world one less architectural treasure to marvel at. For the next decade and a half, Guarino Guarini would design and construct the San Lorenzo Church and Santa Sima Sindone, where Turin's greatest Christian relic, the Holy Shroud of Turin, would be kept on display. Suffice to say, we'll cover these two masterpieces of Italian Baroque in future episodes. Understand, Guarino Guarini had decades of preparation before taking on the creation of the Palazzo Carignano. The palace Guarini designed was atypical for the region in more ways than one. Built around a central courtyard, the Palazzo Carignano would be made of brick. But it's what Guarini would do with this rather common material that was something altogether different and illuminating. 
the sides of the palace would be traditional in design. Two rectilinear arms met the rolling facade looking over the Piazza Carignano, transforming the building site. The front facade was fluid with motion, a complex geometry that would hemorrhage across the face of the royal palace, tethered only by the supportive arms. Two rectangular fronts with four windows across, these features separated by meticulously executed brick Corinthian columns rise up from the first floor. Simpler Tuscan columns, adorned with strange patterns across their centers, rested atop one another, like bow ties as they ascended. These intricacies clad the palace like a Baroque garment nestled against the curves of a Bernini sculpture. The windows on the second story boasted the curvaceous flare of excess, with brick along their sides and feathers draping down from the Iroquois headdress, covering the uppermost part of the extravagant surround. Harkening back to the regiment of Carignano, sent years prior to Canada on a mission of national protection. But it was at the center, where the deepest grandeur lay. Inward curves bowed outwards into a rotunda, displayed on the face of the building. A superficial dome at the crest, the oval dome, unique for secular architecture, was hidden behind the broken pediment, capped in scrolls, gently caressing the curves of the rotunda. It's almost as if Guarini crafted the crux of this building to symbolize the House of Savoy's centrality. The balcony overlooking the piazza is perched upon a pair of Renaissance-style Tuscan columns, with composite columns supporting the shallow hemisphere just above. The Palazzo Carignano sits at the epicenter of the Piedmontese city-state, and from this balcony, Prince Emmanuel could survey his shallow kingdom. So as we look upon Guarini's grandest creation, this palace home, we see what he built for the deaf, voiceless prince, a building to speak on El Muto's behalf, a building to carry his legacy through time to share with us its stories, culture, and life.